A lot of things have fallen to New Orleans. Not always good things. Stick around as Little Easy and I look into the great fires that changed the course of the city. In recent history, we have had catastrophic events. Hurricanes are a good example. These things have changed something deep inside the soul of the city. Yeah. But the Big Easy is no stranger to this world of shaking devastation. Not at all. <laughs> On March 21st, 1788, at around 1.30 p.m. on Good Friday, the fire started right here where we stand. Now, Little Easy and I have a disagreement over how this fire started. That's right, it started because a shock monster decides a Godzilla came and set fire to the whole city. Really? Yes. I don't know. My the, the research. Is ironclad. My research shows a slightly different course of events. Mm -hmm. What I have, it says, at the home of Army Treasurer Don Vicente Jose Nunez, located right here, 619 Charter Street behind mm -hmm. us, a candle, most likely on Good Friday altar, in his home started the fire. A strong southeast wind, as we're having today, assisted in a rapid spread of the fire. Now, the twist is that, at the time, all organized response to any fires were alerted by the church bells at then St. Louis Church, which is right down the street here. Being Good Friday, the priests refused to allow church bells to be rung as a fire alarm. That seems like a gross oversight. Eh, they learned quickly. This delay in response allowed the fire to take hold, and in five hours it had consumed almost the entire city. It spared the riverfront buildings, including the Customs House, the Tobacco Warehouse, the Governor's Building, the Royal Hospital, and the Ursuline Convent. But it destroyed 856 of the 1,100 structures in the city. Colonial officials discussed new building codes to replace the wooden buildings with masonry structures, which had courtyards, thick brick walls, arcades, and wrought iron balconies. But it wasn't decided fast enough. Just six years later, on December 8, 1794, boys playing in a courtyard over on Royal Street lost control of a fire with southerly gusts and the flames ignited adjacent to a wooden house. Uh -oh. Three hours later, the conflagration had consumed 212 structures, most of them just a few years old since there was a fire Ooh. in 1788. It was devastating blow to an already struggling city and as Little Easy says, sock, sock monster devastation. devastation. So. This time, the Spanish Dons responded by endeavoring not only a, to suppress fire, but also to prevent them in the future. They looked to their own building traditions to do so. Uh, Cabildo Records, which we're standing right next to, state that new houses must be built of bricks and with flat roofs and tiles. The new building code is what gives the French Quarter its distinct look today, not yeah. French at all. We interrupt this video to ask if you're enjoying our content, please remember to subscribe. It's a big deal for us. Don't forget to hit the like button and the bell if you're into that sort of thing. If you'd like to give us a little lanyap helping us make bigger and better videos, you can go to our Patreon page to become a patron at one of five different levels. As always, you can find our vids all about us as well as our merch store on our website, www.bigeasylife.org. Okay. Back to the video. With the city on its knees, it could have easily been abandoned and left to wallow, but good often comes during hardship. Don't you agree? Yes. So after the 1788 fire, Governor Esteban Miro acted decisively and immediately. The morning after the fire, he issued a general order preventing anyone from raising the price of provisions above their former value. Officials sent messages to planters up and down the Mississippi River from New Orleans to send their crops to market and distribute the goods among the newly poor. They borrowed from the royal coffers to send three ships to Philadelphia to buy flour, so to prevent famine. And within 24 hours, they managed to find shelter for every last resident that was displaced. That's impressive. Miro was even said to have spent part of the day standing in front of his house handing out money to those who needed it most. In 1795, Don Andreas Almanesta de Rojas came forward and agreed to pay for construction of the building now known as the Cabildo. It replaced an earlier structure that had been destroyed as part of the 1788 fire. 
Helman Este had already commissioned Gilberto Guillemard to design the new cathedral and presbyter, which is behind us, as a gift to the city, rounding out what the cornerstone would be of this new Jackson Square. Now, Madame Gravier and her husband, Don Beltran Gravier, drew up plans to subdivide the pl their plantation and allow the city to expand upriver into what would now be known as the American sector to give new places to build. The center of the new suburb included a public plaza that would later be named Lafayette Square. If you're visiting New Orleans and you're interested in seeing buildings from that era, the, the pickings are pretty slim, but- Most of them burned down. They're truly worth seeing. There's the Ursuline Convent at 1100 Charter Street. It was completed in 1752 and is the oldest building in the Mississippi Delta. Yeah. There's Lafitte's Blacksmith Shop on Bourbon Street, most likely built as a home around 1770, and its location was spared in both fires. There's Madame John's Legacy at 632 Domaine Street. It was built in 1789 after the first Great Fire and it was spared in 1794. It's one of the finest examples of 18th century Louisiana Creole architecture. Yep. The Napoleon House at 500 Charters is also a place to see. It was built in 1794 and has such great history, I think it could be an episode all its own. Yeah. Viva la France. Indeed. Is the Cabildo right behind us here at Jackson Square. It was home of the Spanish government. The original building burned in 88. The current building was erected between 1795 and 1799. It was fairly new when it held the proceedings for the Louisiana Purchase Transfer in 1803. It's a very good place to visit too. Most certainly a great very, museum. Probably deserves its own. The neighboring Presbyter, which is right over to the side of us, construction was started in 1791 and it finished in the early 1800s after several delays. All these sites have great histories and stories that are worth exploring. If I missed any, let us know in the comments below. Well, I hope we've given you some insight into the great fires in New Orleans, as well as some great locations to visit. If you get a chance, please visit our website at www.bigeasy.org and wait, what is that? Uh, we're gonna run, thanks and well, you know, uh, no.